Well, if you'll uh, get your Bibles out, we're going to keep moving through the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter 5, verse 22 today. And this sermon is entitled, The Grace and Glory of Submission. The Grace and Glory of Submission. So starting in Ephesians 5, in verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Lord, we thank you for the words of Scripture, God, with a twofold message, Lord, that gives us an admonition about how to relate to each other in holy matrimony. But God, even for those of us who are not married, this is a symbol for us to look at and gaze the relationship of Christ and his church, Lord. Lord, you laid your life down for us, God. Lord, you've given everything to us. You've washed us and sanctified us through the cross and are continuing to sanctify us through your word and your spirit, God. And Lord, I pray that we would see the value of a, of a bridegroom, Lord, who, who has given so much, God, and that we would keep ourselves spotless, Lord, and, and holy and set apart, Lord, as we, as we await your return, God. Lord, and I thank you that in these next few moments that you will speak by your spirit through your preached word, through this humble vessel. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul talked in the first half of chapter 5 about how we as a church should relate to each other. And the way we are supposed to relate to each other, all of us, is under the guiding principle of walking in love. Now we have to remember that we do not mean love the way the world means love. Love is not a feeling. Love is not something that's easily cast away. Love is not something you fall in and fall out of. Love is a commitment you make. Love is obedience. Love is sacrifice. This is biblical love. So Paul showed showed us in the first half that as Christians, we relate to each other this way. Why? Because we are members of the same body. One of us are hands, and another is a foot, and another is an eye, and another is a mouth, and, and, and all these sort of things. This analogy shows us that we need each other. We need each other. When one part of the body is sick or not well or injured, it is our job to protect and restore and correct and help and heal. I kind of gave this sort of joking analogy the last time we were together in this book. But when your hand cramps up, you don't think, well, it's not working too good. Let's cut it off. It's a very serious thing to cut something out of the body. We shouldn't take it lightly. The job of the guiding principle of walking in love is restoration to all who are part of the body of Christ, of which Christ himself is the head. Christ-like love is about submission, sacrifice, favoring others over oneself. Love is doing what is truly beneficial or right for someone despite the personal cost it, it impacts on you. Love is doing right by somebody. Love is laying your life down for somebody. Love is not a feeling. It is a choice and a commitment. And as a Christian, this is how we should view marriage. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with preaching a message that's exclusively about marriage from, Hebrew, or, uh, from Ephesians chapter 5. If you were doing a sermon on marriage, you could dip into 1 Corinthians, you could dip into uh, Ephesians 5, and you could sort of pull out the guiding principles of what a godly marriage looks like. And while we're going to talk about that a little bit, instead of doing that, we are going through this book expositionally uh, and, and exegetically, which means we're trying to read out what Paul was saying to these people as he, as he wrote this letter. So we're going to see that while it gives us beneficial and important information about what, a, about what a biblical marriage looks like, it is also, and most importantly, meant to draw our attention to the relationship between Christ and His bride, the church. Verse 32 makes this clear. It says, This mystery is profound. And I'm saying this, that it refers to Christ in the church. So that's what he's talking about. But he says, however, let each one of you, let each wife, uh, excuse me, let each one of you love his wife as himself and to the wife see that she respects her husband. So the, the principles he's laying out for biblical marriage are binding. They're commandments. But we can't, we can't lose sight of the point of this because without that point, the overarching view of Christ in the church we are unable to function within the body correctly, relationally to each other as friends, families, brother, sister. And then we get to a more intimate relationship, husbands and wives. Later, we'll talk about slaves and masters, something that was a very real thing in this culture. And then children and their parents. And the overarching principle in all of these relationships is submission, sacrifice, love, and obedience for the sake of God's glory, not for the, the benefits that you might derive from those relationships. Secondly, the Bible has much more to say on the issue of marriage than is just mentioned here, as well as it has much more to say about Christ's relationship with the church. Paul is always giving directions to Christians in light of the love of God, the grace of God, and the law of God. Don't forget that no, despite what modern hipster preachers tell you, that the Old Testament is not unhitched from the New Testament. The Old Testament is the context, the, the tree that which we are grafted into. It shows us the need for grace. And the law of God is the character of God, which is unchanging. Don't be confused when people say that the law, we, we're not subject to the law. We aren't subject to the law according to salvation. We couldn't live up to the law. We can't be saved by the law, but that doesn't mean we discard it. We live in light of the law. And we live according to the law by the grace of God. Not for the sake of being saved, but because we love God. Because we want to obey God. You know, Christianity is not about depriving yourself of a list of things you wish you could do, right? And then not being able to do the things you really want to do. So I can't do the things I want to do, and I have to do this list of things I don't want to do. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is about a heart that changes, that actually desires to do the things that pleases God, and doesn't want to do the things that, that grieves God anymore. Now, you will fall short in this. Just like I will fall short in my marriage to my wife. Or just like I will fall short as a pastor to you or a friend to you. But that is not the standard I set for myself. Well, I'm going to fall short anyway. No, I'm going to strive. Not because I'm trying to earn something, but because I love you. Because I love my wife. And because I love God. So let's look back at the beginning, the middle part of chapter 5, starting in verse 15, so we can kind of come into the context of what we're about to talk to in regards to marriage. Verse 15 says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand the will of what the will of the Lord is. Of course, he says, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And then hear this last part, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So before we look at the individual relationship in the context of marriage, or masters and slaves, or children and parents, we must see that all believers are supposed to live their lives in light of the governing principle of walking in love and mutual submission. Our attitudes towards each other should be that of favoring each other. Not the sort of relationships we once had where we think what we can get out of it. The thing we should be thinking about when we meet up with brothers, younger brothers in the faith, is what can I give? How can I lower myself? How can I submit myself? Listen, submission is not a bad word. The reason we think it is is because we are rebellious sinners who want to govern and lord over our own lives. We live in a fallen and rebellious world that hates the idea of authority, hates the idea of submission, and instead elevates personal autonomy. Listen, wives aren't submissive and honoring to their husbands because they aren't submitted to God. Husbands do not serve and lay their lives down for their wives and giving them love and affection because they are not submitted to God. The reason why we don't lay our lives down for our wives and the reason why our wives don't live honoring towards us is because we are not submitted to God. How do I know this? Because God himself, through the Apostle Paul and the inspiration of the Spirit, is commanding us to do this. But this isn't a new commandment. This is rooted in the Old Testament. We obey God in these areas out of reverence for Christ. Now, the marriage relationship is where this shows most brightly. But even in our own lives, as we relate to each other as brothers, submission, sacrifice, forgiveness, love. What's it say in 1 Corinthians? What is love? Love is not keeping a record of wrongs. Love doesn't have its own interest at heart. This kind of love, it says, never fails. Because this is God's kind of love. But when we look at our relationship to each other, and especially in the most intimate relationship that we have on earth, the relationship where nothing's supposed to be held back, there's supposed to be no secrets, there's supposed to be no dark spaces, there's supposed to be no lies, there's supposed to be nothing that you don't know and she don't know, this intimate relationship mirrors the kind of relationship we are to have with God. And he does it in a very unique and complimentary way as he shows the way a woman honors God by loving submission and a husband lays down his life in a radical fashion. There's a lot of people in culture who hate this scripture and they hate talking about it and they try to do gymnastics with them. So that's not really what it meant. It means this or that. Listen, that is nonsense. It means what it says. We shouldn't be trying to impress a culture that can't even find its own identity. That's running around in the streets, chasing after each other with their fists raised and anger in their eyes. Listen, they don't have anything for us, but we have something for them. And it is the love of God. And that love is manifest in sacrifice and forgiveness and surrender. We should stop trying to explain ourselves to the world and showcase what God's love looks like. And the way we do that, in a very dramatic sense, Paul is saying, is in the most important relationship and relationships, the nuclear family. A husband who devotes his entire life to one woman and a woman who votes her entire life to her husband. There is nothing about falling in and out of love. It's a commitment you make for better, for worse, until death and this life does part us. These aren't just words we say. This is in reverence for Christ is where these marriage vows came from. Now listen, I'm not trying to make you feel bad if, if you made some horrible mistakes and have a blended family or divorced your wife before Christ. Listen, the grace of God is sufficient for sinners like us. But that doesn't mean moving forward that that is the standard or the norm of how we live our lives. See, now in Christ we have a new identity. And we have a new objective. And that objective is to bring glory to God. You know why you need to, to get married when you leave this place? 
Why it should be the reason you want to be married? So that you can bring glory to God. You know why you should pick the place you work? Because that place is the place that you figured out that you can bring the most glory to God. You know why you bear children in this life? So you can raise them up and offer them as a sacrifice. I don't mean, you know, like Bell. <laughs> raise them up in the admonition of God. Listen, the nuclear family is godlike. And there's a reason this culture is raging against it. Because it glorifies the Creator who created man and created woman and said, this is good. And there's a reason why those are the only two that can replicate themselves. Because that is for the glory of God. We obey God in these areas and in all areas of the Christian life because we reverence Christ. We obey God in these areas and in all areas because we have thankful hearts. And because we love Christ. So what Paul does here with the marriage relationship is he explains how marriage and family should model Christ in the church. The nuclear family is the bedrock of what God desires to display his love, grace, mercy, and glory in the earth. This is why the devil wants to destroy the family. Let me say this. If you are single, then you are to honor God by keeping yourself unstained by the world. And I'm not going to put some weird thing on you. I personally believe if you have a desire in your heart for a mate, that God hasn't called you to that sort of ministry of singleness. There are people that God has called to singleness, and I believe those people find joy in that. But don't be afraid, like, oh, I hope I'm not that person, because I really, to de I really desire to, to walk through life with somebody. Well, that desire in your heart, in my opinion, is a good thing. God says it's a good thing. But the question most of us ask is, where is the, the woman or the mate that fits me, that has what I want, that will treat me good? See, listen, you're asking all the wrong questions. When you think about a godly woman that you want to spend your life with, you need to ask yourself this question. Am I a godly enough a man to be part of a godly woman's life? Am I a safe and honorable man who would put someone before myself? Are you even capable of putting something before yourself? And don't get me started on children. Listen, if you're a single parent or were raised by a single parent like I was, there's no condemnation on you. But you have to admit that it wasn't the right balance. You need the love of a mother. You need the authority of a father. God created it and said it was good. And out of that love and commitment to Christ, we bear children. This beautiful gift that God gives us. Start with verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now listen, submit is a good word, but the Greek word really holds two meanings, and that's why certain translations render it one way and certain translations render it the other. It really means submit and obey. There's many versions that say wives obey your husbands, but our, our modern culture doesn't care for that. It doesn't, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't fit in with feminism. But I'm here to tell you the reason why we flinch at words like that is because we are rebellious. Now let's talk a little bit about what this means though. Let's, let's clear a couple of things up. One is, this doesn't mean that the, the husband is the savior of the wife. See, the wife has her own relationship with Christ where she gives glory to God. Listen, there's going to be some times in certain marriages, maybe in your marriage, where a godly woman has been the bedrock upon which your marriage was found as you meander it out in the world. She has her own relationship with Christ, and she is to submit to you in a, in a fashion because she reverences God, not because you're a good man, and vice versa. Now, let me say something else about this. We're talking about willful submission. Forced submission is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about some sort of idea that a husband is a, the lord of the house. 
in some sort of misogynistic way where he comes in and his desires better be met and his rules better be followed. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the job of a woman is to compliment or help her husband. You say, well, help her, that seems sort of demeaning. Listen, there's only one other person called helper in the Bible, and that is God, the helper, the spirit. Listen, the problem is, and here's what our problem is, is we use authority in this life to assign value. Oh, come on. You know it's true. Hey, my name's Josh. What's yours? What do you do for a living? I don't work at the bank. I manage the bank. I don't work there. I own it. We think about authority in this sort of like, sort of pyramid sort of way. Listen, authority has to do with role and responsibility. Yes, headship does have a different responsibility, but that has nothing to do with value. And the reason why we reject authority is because in our culture, it means power means value. Those who are more powerful have more value. And friends, that is not the way God looks at anything. In fact, he says, listen, if that's the way you look at things, you've got no part in my kingdom. I didn't come to, to be served. I mean, I could be because I'm the king, but I actually came to serve. Servant leadership. There can only be one head. But as humans, we often view this in relationship to value instead of fulfilling God's design, God's ordained role. Listen, like I said before, this is deeply rooted in the Old Testament. And this isn't the only scripture that says this. But in Genesis 3.16, when it's talking about the fall of man, it says, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. And in pain you shall bring forth children. And your desire shall be contrary or for your husband. But he shall rule over you. Now listen, this is something that God instituted because the fall of man. Because there had to be some sort of establishment in that. But the word rule there doesn't mean that you um, have the right to mistreat your wife. In fact, we're going to see in a second here, it's quite the opposite. Because see, God calls you both to submit to each other. To submit to each other. Favor each other. Serve each other. Love each other. Okay? And then to the husband... He gives a much more radical call. He asks for much more from us. Male headship does not mean more valuable. In fact, the opposite is true. Male headship is not tyrannical or overbearing, or it's not setting a place where women are demeaned or, or devalued. In fact, it is a, an esteemment. See, the problem is, is we don't look at the church in the value that Christ looks at the church. A prize that he sought after, that he laid his life down for, that he loved and gave everything up for. This is an esteemed place to be set. This is an adored place to be set. This is a beloved place to be set. Not ruled over, not objectified, not disrespected, not mistreated, not anything of that sort. In Genesis, it calls a man's helper the woman. And God knew we would need help. Come on. Any, anyone here married? I can't even, sometimes I button my shirt wrong. Oh, are you going to go out of the house like that? <laughs> Listen. The fact that God has given us such a gracious and good gift should be a humbling a humbling, humbling thought. It uses the word Savior there. Now, not that we are their saviors, but we should be living our lives that way. You don't want to live your life that way? Don't get married. You want to be in charge of your own life? Do what you want with your money? Make your way? Do your thing? Then don't marry somebody. Don't attach yourself to somebody. Because God designed women, and, I, and I'm not trying to read into this, to love and long after men. And, and often in our, in our society, men take that and take advantage of it. 
We don't just do it to our wives, we do it to our mamas. Come on. We know, and so we take advantage of it. Instead of esteeming it and, and, and holding it as a prize and something to be protected and taken care of and loved and served, we use it to our advantage. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. So husbands and wives are called to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Not even out of love for each other. Not to say you don't love each other, but we don't stick to our guns in that commitment of submission and serving each other because we love each other. We do it because we are obeying God out of reverence for a creator and a savior who laid his life down for us. All things we do in this life in obedience to God are out of reverence for Christ. Listen, if you're the kind of person that says, I'm not going to lay my life down for my wife, then you don't reverence Christ. God calls us to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. And wives are called to submit to the headship or the leadership of the husband. But let me just say this. This doesn't mean that you make all the decisions or you call all the shots. You know what it really means? Here's what being the head means. It means in everything, you are the one responsible to redirect your family back to God. When your wife's afraid, you say, listen, we're going to trust God. When your children are going astray, listen, honey, we're going to trust God. Let's get to the church. Let's get to the altar. Let's get on our knees. That's the kind of leadership Jesus displayed. He didn't regard something to be grasped, his place in heaven, so he divested himself and came to earth and took on flesh and died death, a, a painful, shameful, disgraceful death on a cross. That's the kind of leadership you're, you're invited to, to be a husband. Out of reverence for Christ, but listen, also out of love and thanksgiving for the gift God's given you. The best marriage in the world is two people that are dedicated on serving Christ and serving each other. And here's the thing, it can't be tit for tat. Because there's moments where your wife's going to be weak. Or she's not going to be acting very godly. And you're going to have to be consistent because you re reverence Christ. And I assure you there's times where you're going to be the one. That's out of line and out of bounds. You better pray to God that you have a wife that prays for you and stands by you. Not because you're a good man, but because she reverences Christ. Has no, there is no record of wrongs. There is no list. You're making a decision to honor God at the expense of yourself to another person for the rest of your life. And guess what compounds that? Children. But here's the thing, if you really are a believer in Christ, giving yourself away for the glory of God is something you're already used to doing. You've already denied yourself. You've already picked up your cross. You're already following Jesus. So the idea of living a life that honors God more, that blesses God more, that models Christ in the church should be something you're excited about. Something that you're, listen, I'm not saying this pridefully, I fall short, but I, I look, I want ways that I can honor my wife. I want to put a smile on her face. I want to be there for her when she needs me. Not off at some place where she can't get me to answer the phone. Or looking at the bank account going, what did he spend money on again? Listen, laying down your life means laying down every area of your life emotionally, financially, your time. Listen, the effort of your life now means one thing. We're going to serve God. And my greatest honor and mission in life is to lay my life down for you. You talk about submitting to your husband. Listen, everybody's got emotional baggage in past. But I've never met a godly woman who didn't want to follow a man who laid down his entire life for his wife and his kids. 
There's no question about where your, where your priorities are. There's no question about your motivation. You're humble, you're meek, you're lowly. When she blows up at you, just you hold it together. You're patient with your children. You're not looking for ways to spend money on yourself and follow your... Listen, you are thinking, and here's the thing too. You're not off making decisions for your family. You're talking to your helper who has wisdom and saying, what do we do? Let's seek God together. Being the head, listen, I, this isn't about marriage, but you know, I work under Lauren. But Lauren didn't always just come into my office and tell me what we're going to do. There's areas where maybe I have some wisdom. And he says, listen, what, you know, what do you think about this? It's a big decision. What do we do here? The fact that he's the head doesn't mean that he's a fool. Listen, you know what the smart people do? They surround themselves with people who are wise. And then they're humble. That's just a practical business thing. How much more should it be with your wife? Someone who can see things about you you can't see about yourself. I promise you there's things about you you can't see. But that woman who loves you can. She's trying to help you. And if you lay your life down for her like Christ did for the church, recklessly, with abandonment, there ain't going to be a lot of need to talk about who the head is. It never comes up in my marriage. I never say, listen, because usually... It's, it's about us praying and, and seeking God together. What kind of leader was Jesus? A humble leader. And he knew everything. I don't know that much. Thank God he gave me a smart helper who cares about me. But here's the truth, brothers. Not all of you are going to be in that situation. Or maybe down the road, I might not be in that situation. There may become a time where my wife goes through a desperate depression or falls into some sort of sin. It's already happened the other way in our marriage where she waited for me and prayed for me when other godly people were saying, hey, listen, divorce him and go live your life. God understands. No, he doesn't. Listen, if your husband is beating up on you, I'm not saying stay in the house. Take your kids and go somewhere safe. That doesn't mean you have to divorce them. Listen, if your wife ran around on you and cheated on you, what's the option? We're going to get divorced? Well, the Bible says you're free to. But I'm talking about a sort of love that never fails. And your commitments to God first and foremost. I'm not saying there's never a time for divorce. I'm not saying there's not. But I'm saying the Bible's pretty clear about this. The glory of God. Listen, the problem is, as a culture, we say, if it's making you inconvenienced or suffer for any amount of time, then break it off and, and go find something that works better for you. Thank God that he didn't look at his love towards us in that way. And that's what we're modeling in marriage. We're modeling sacrificial, unconditional, passionate love. There's so much more we could say about this, but we got to keep moving forward. My job as the head of my marriage isn't to rule my wife or make all the decisions. My primary purpose is to direct my family towards God, to keep my family in church, to make sure my children know God's word, to make sure my children see a man that fears the Lord, that lives according to the words he says from this pulpit. Don't you think those, those thoughts are going through my mind as my wife is pregnant now and I realize that I'm going to have a little disciple following me around looking at everything I say from this wooden pulpit and expecting me to walk it out? Listen, I already should be doing that in front of my wife. My job as a man, as a head, is to lay my life down in every area of my life. And if your life is laid down, if you're that kind of leader, a godly woman will want to partner with that. Here's why it's such a, a hard and foreign concept to the world. And many lukewarm, worldly, carnal people claiming to be Christians. It's because submission and obedience to Christ, listen, is in a major part of the Christian discipleship they're engaged in. The idea of submitting your life for your wife, it should just be like a natural progression in the submission you've already made to God. 
listen, sort of like hipster, lukewarm, middle class Christian theology doesn't tell you that. But there's no such thing as lukewarm Christianity. There's only disciple making, life surrendering, cross carrying discipleship. And if you've already made that commitment to follow Jesus, then when he asks you to do that in your marriage for the glory of God, it's not this foreign concept. It's just another way to express your reverence and love for Christ. The reason it's hard for our world is because we're, we're, we're full of authors like, girl, go wash your face or whatever it's called, where it tells you to do you and chase your dreams. Godless garbage. Well, your, your mate's got Alzheimer's now, so no one would judge you if you left. She's been depressed a long time. You deserve to be happy. Garbage. Love is not a feeling. Love is a commitment. Love is a choice. It doesn't mean there's not feelings associated with it. It just means the feelings aren't what drive the relationship. There's beauty. Listen, we're talking about commitment. And some, sometimes we, we're not used to those things and we think about it in a bad context. Like we think about authority and obedience. But listen, those aren't bad things. There's nothing more beautiful than a committed, long-term relationship that grows and blooms into something you never could have imagined. Physically, sexually, spiritually, emotionally. We've just been on the scratch in the outside surface and wondering why life is so empty. Because we don't have any depth in any of our relationships. And God's saying, your relationship with me better have depth. And guess what? It's going to be displayed in the way you treat the person you're married to, most of all. It's a foreign, foreign and hard concept for people to accept because submission and obedience to Christ isn't a major version or a major part of, of America's version of Christianity. We don't strive to honor God in our marriages and follow the commandments He has laid down on this issue because we don't strive to honor and reverence God. Verse 28. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. Just like Christ does the church because we are members of his body. What did we talk about the other day when we studied the parable of the Good Samaritan? Love your neighbor as yourself. How do you love yourself? You make sure you got food. Boy, in addiction, we were rabid about it too. We're going to make sure we get ours. Right? Listen, we take care of ourselves naturally. We think about ourselves naturally. And when two flesh become one, we have to learn to think about our wife as one, an extension of our body. And actually an extension that we favor more than we favor this part. <laughs> How can you best love, serve, and lead your wife? How can you be a good husband? Those of you who want to be husbands. Those of you who are husbands. Those of you that need to raise your sons how to be good husbands. By loving God and obeying God. A good marriage is made up of two God-fearing servants who are humble, forgiving people whose ultimate job in life is to find ways to love, serve, and honor each other despite what the other does. This is God's kind of love. When you get married, you got to make your mind up. It don't matter what she does. Out of reverence and respect for God, here's what I'm going to do. And you have to pray that by God's grace that your wife is that same sort of person. That's why getting married is a big deal. That's why you shouldn't be unequally yoked. It's not, it's not always easy to be married to a Christian woman. You think you're going to have any luck marrying a, a, a good-looking woman who don't have any fear or reverence for God? Come on. The most important question is, does that person love and fear God? Now, what if you're married to someone right now who doesn't love and fear God? Well, you're married, and you made a commitment. And your job now is to love them and faithfully serve them and try to lead them to God. 
It's going to be hard. It's going to sanctify you. It's going to change you. But if you aren't already married to someone, do not join yourself with an unbeliever. It says this in 2 Corinthians 6. What does darkness have to do with light? What does Jesus have to do with the devil? Listen, set yourself apart from the world. Listen, because not only are we husbands, we are also the bride of Christ who is supposed to be set apart, keeping ourselves holy and pure for Christ who has already bought us with the price and is coming to redeem us. We are betrothed to him. And in a broader context, a godly marriage should be an example of how we, the bride, live in subjection to Christ. And this is what it's really all about. Loving, honoring, subjection, submission to Christ. Being the leader of your house just means you're the, the chief servant, the one with the most responsibility, the one who's supposed to, to surrender first. The one who's supposed to lay down your life more. Listen, it doesn't let women off the hook. Women has their marching orders from God. And God has created us in diversely different ways to come together and be one. And this world wants to tell us that the distinctions between men and women are not beautiful or sacred or important or good, but they are. Verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, even though this isn't a lesson on specific characteristics of marriage, we got to talk about this one. As a husband, as a man, before you get married, you're supposed to do what a Jewish groom did. You're supposed to be able to be a man who stands on your own two feet. You need to get a job. You need to make sure you're saving money. You need to make sure you're doing positive things so when you invite this woman to join herself to you that you're not a train, train that's going off a, a bridge or a ship that's sinking. And most importantly, you're supposed to unhitch from the cord that you're tied to. You know what that cord is? Mommy and daddy. Or for some of you, it may be grandma. It says, listen, you must leave your father and mother and cleave to your wife. That means when things are going bad at home, you don't run home to mama and sleep on her couch. You stand flat-footed at your house and you figure out a way to work through it. And you know how that usually happens? Submitting. Serving. And most of the time, we bring it on ourselves. You know what ends most, most problems? Is absolute Honesty. Now, I'm not saying if you're completely honest with each other, you'll never have a headache, but you'll have a lot less. If your wife knows that emotionally you belong to her, financially, you're not thinking about how you can buy that new boat or that new guitar or that new whatever. You're thinking, what does my family need? What does my son need? What, what does my wife need? What does our future need? And it's time to unhitch from mommy and daddy, emotionally, financially. Listen, honor and respect them and love them. Go to them for advice. But once you're married, your commitment is to your wife. Hey, listen, I got another one for you. If you're, you're going to have a mixed family where you're blended with you know, kids from other relationships and stuff, your wife comes first. And if you're not willing to put your wife before your children or some single moms need to hear this too. Listen, if you're, willing, if you're going to marry a man and you've got a kid, you better be willing to put him first. Because the relationship you have is what's going to model to this child. It's God first, marriage second, children third, and everything else a far second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. You've got to leave mommy and daddy. You've got to put childish ways behind you. I'm not saying you can't play video games. But if you ain't going to work, it's time to be a man and be someone that your wife can respect. Be someone she can feel safe for. Listen, all men and women aren't the same, and I'm not trying to generalize things, but from the scripture, it's clear to me that men and women need two very distinct things. Listen, women need security. Now listen, men, we always go financial security, right? 
Well, they need that too. But they also need emotional security. They need to know they can trust you with their hearts, that they can trust you with their fears, that they can trust you to come home at night, that they can trust you not to be on that WhatsApp or whatever garbage way that you can, you know, talk to some other girl. They need to be able to feel secure with you. And a woman that feels secure will give you what you need. And you know what you need? You need honor and respect. That's why God commands her to give it to you. You know that's what you need. Without it, we're like little boys with our feelings hurt. There's nothing better than when your wife makes you feel like the man. When she treats you. You know, listen, and my wife treats me that way. Now listen, when we get home, she might go... It's time to talk about this. Well, she honors me in front of people. She honors me. And even in behind closed doors, she honors me. Even though I don't always deserve it. I lose my temper, say something I don't mean, react out of fear. She's, she's a good wife. And I'm trying my best to be the kind of guy that lays my life down. Not when it's convenient, not when you're not around, but all the time. One flesh... As we become one flesh in Christ, like us, listen, us and the Father, the Father and us, just like Jesus Christ, right? The Spirit of God living us, we become one with God, part of His body. Marriage is the same way. You become one flesh. You become one unit. There is no more yours and I's. There's ours. And as the husband, guess what? You need to figure out what she needs and what your children need. One flesh as two become one with Christ, there is nothing more sanctifying, humbling, hard, challenging, rewarding, frustrating, powerful, beautiful, and precious, and meaningful than marriage. Except raising kids, maybe. But there's nothing that will draw you nearer to God. In fact, that's the purpose of marriage. That's the purpose of everything. Everything is to draw you near to God. Verse 32. We're going to get done pretty early tonight. The mystery is profound, and I'm saying that this refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So Paul is saying all of this, and we glean these principles that we've just talked about. But we need to remember that the foundation of these things is God. And the love that God has shown for us. And the grace and compassion God has given us. And our marriage is supposed to model that. And the way we rear our children is supposed to model that. And, and, and next week we'll talk about slaves and masters. In that context, real slaves and masters. In our context, you could say employers and, and employees. In every relationship you have to God, you do it for the glory of God. You do it in obedience to God. You give your best in all because you are belonging to God. Just like in every message I preach, it's because we're living for a future city. Our trust is in God. It's not in the outcome of this life. Like for many of you here, the hardest thing you'll ever do is submit yourself to an intern that you don't have any respect for. But you're doing out of reverence for Christ. Not because they deserve it. God is going to ask you to respect a lot of people in this life that according to you don't deserve it. But you're doing it out of reverence for Christ. And also because you have a thankful heart. Because if you're really saved... That's how you see life now. Everything's a gift. I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful, yeah, I got to listen to this guy, but I'm not in prison. I'm thankful the air is still coursing in and out of my lungs. I'm thankful that she still answers the phone. I'm thankful that I got another chance to raise my kids. Even if they're adults, I still get to talk to them. I've got another chance. God has shown you grace, and Thanksgiving is the evidence of that. And that's the most important part, the foundation of Christ. And marriage is just another way to display it. We do these things out of willful submission towards each other. And listen, Christianity is about having willful submission and reverence towards Christ. We don't obey God in this life because He makes us. He doesn't make us. If we've seen the truth about the love God's shown for us in the gospel, we'll want to. 
It's not like, hey, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. So you're going to hell anyway. Everybody's going to hell. We know that, right? You're in my chapels enough. You hear that, right? God's not sending anybody. We're all heading to hell. And the fact that God intervened in any of our lives is grace. You deserve it. You're headed there. And then out of love, God came and intervened and brought you out. And that gratefulness should be the benchmark of your life. You'll live a life marked with love and service and sacrifice and forgiveness towards others because you'll see everything inside of the fact that God who owed you judgment, condemnation, destruction instead gave you not just forgiveness, not just a pardon. He gave you place in his royal family. He gave you a promise that you will be a co-heir with Christ. We do these things out of willful submission towards God. And we do this because we are the church, and the church is the betrothed of Christ. Because we're going to spend just a minute talking about this. We've talked about this in the parables we've talked about. We've talked about this in a lot of things. But listen, in Jewish culture, a man would come to a virgin girl, and he would, they would propose marriage, and they would become betrothed. Betrothed is like engagement, except it means a lot more. There's already a commitment in place. Betrothed means that you're mine and I'm yours, and I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to go build a house for you. I'm going to get some things ready for you. And your job is to stay here and keep yourself pure and holy and unstained by the world and abstain from gossip or speculation and be ready when I come back. And marriage is an example of that, but that is our job in this life. We are betrothed to Christ. Men, don't balk your head at that because we're called the bride of Christ. We are the betrothed, honored, esteemed, loved object of His affection. Make yourself holy and pure. Listen, He bought you as you prostituted yourself out in the world. He didn't need you. He bought you. He bought me. And he says, I'm going to buy you to set you free and be with me. Read the story of Hosea sometime. The book of Hosea talks about a godly man who God called to marry this woman. He bought her out of prostitution and she went back again. And he looked for her. And it says he went and bought her back again. He wanted to talk to her. It's his wife. He shouldn't have to ask another man but he still paid the fee so that he could have her back. And the best part is through God's word, through his spirit, he has washed you clean. He is sanctifying you. Listen, you know how God sees you if you're in Christ? Spotless, without blemish. He sees you through the imputed righteousness of Christ. Now live accordingly. We obey the Bible in all areas of our life out of love for Christ. Without true love and devotion to Christ, it is impossible to have a biblical marriage and it is impossible to have a biblical life. So once again, we see all things draw us to dependence and submission to Christ. I want to love and serve my wife because I love her. But the reason why I'm going to be a good husband isn't because the way I feel towards my wife from today or tomorrow. It's because I am committed to Christ. Didn't sound romantic. Didn't sound like a song with an acoustic guitar. But that's the kind of love that never fails. Because my human love will fail. My ability will fail. My power will fail. I couldn't save myself and I sure can't save her. But through Christ, we are both saved. And my job is to betroth her, love her, and present her to God as something pure and holy. By living my life that way. By raising my kids that way. By giving her an opportunity to live that way. This is the mystery of the gospel. The love of God that he has towards us and that changes us. Don't worry, I'm not starting a whole new section, but we have to talk about this. Without the love of God, it is impossible to live a godly life. Galatians 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit. The evidence that you really are a Christian is this. Love. 
reciprocating the unyielding, passionate, cross, blood-drenched love that Jesus had for you. Accepting that love and the evidence that you've accepted that love is that you will be at peace. You will be filled with joy. You will be patient. You will be kind. You will be gentle. Listen, you will be self-controlled. It's possible to be self-controlled. It's possible not to tilt your head when a member of the opposite sex walks by. Listen, you're doing it for reverence of Christ. I know this is a different context, but I'm going to close by reading 1 Corinthians 13. Now, this is in context of using the spiritual gifts in a generous and and, and loving way because there's a lot of debate about the spiritual gifts. But the principlematic things it says about the love of God are very important. And I just want to close it out and frame it this way. So he says in verse 1 of 13, he says, If I speak in tongues of men and angels... But have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Listen to this one. It does not insist on its own way. Want to have a good marriage? How about stop insisting on your own way all the time? It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Listen, endures all things. Love never ends, or like another version says, love never fails. Prophecies, they'll pass away. Tongues, they will cease. Knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Listen, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but even then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It's time to put childish ways behind us. We're talking about marriage, but we're also talking about our relationship to Christ. It's time to lay our lives down for something greater. Listen, marriage is a beautiful way this can be displayed. There's no more rewarding relationship you can have than having someone who knows you and someone you know, someone you trust, someone that's got scars on her stomach because she bore your children and stood by you when you were in jail and didn't give up on you. But listen, that's not enough. What's enough is a love of God that saved your souls and binds you together. And it's time for us as men, because that's who we mostly are here, as men is to stand up, stop being children, stop looking through a glass dimly, and realize that the love of God that hasn't failed in our life needs to be displayed in all our relationships. The people who are over you in authority, you need to subject yourself to them. People that are under your authority, you better be good to them. People who are in relationship and friendship with you, you better trust them and be honest to them and love them. People that are bound to you by marriage, you better lay your life down for them. People who are depending on you like your children, you better stop being a child and live your life for them. Because this is evidence that you're living your life for God. And we're not talking about having the best job where you can make up for everything because you make a bunch of money. I'm talking about being a man who answers the phone when your grown children call. I'm talking about being a man who comes home every night with his paycheck in hand and his wife having no doubt where you've been. I'm talking about honoring God in a way that is beautiful. And listen, we didn't talk a lot about this, but it is so rewarding. And it's so beautiful. The sanctity of marriage, we see it lived out in marriage and childbearing. 
And it's from this sacrifice and love and submission where two flesh become one that we see evidence of the way God has loved us. The way God has loved you. And God is coming for you. And here's what your job is. We talked about your job as a husband is. We've talked about what your job as a wife is. But your job as a Christian is to keep yourself from being polluted from the world. To keep your life set apart. You better start doing it while you're in here. If you can't do it in here, you're not going to do it out there. Smartphones, pornography, people, freedom. Use this time to get some roots and some strength. Start reverencing God in this place. You, wanna, you want your family when you get out of this place? Become a man that's worthy of them. Live a life of thanksgiving to a God that gave you a second chance. If you don't see this as an opportunity at life, if you see this as a punishment, you're just wasting your time. If you're going to just go out and live for yourself again, I'm not going to tell you to go because I pray you'll stay longer or maybe your eyes will be open and I don't have to do your funeral. Lord, I thank you for these group of men, God. I thank you for your love, God. A love that is uncomparable. Lord, uncomprehensible, Lord. Even as I marvel at your love in the cross, your love is coming to a world where you are handled as a baby by the hands of sinful men. Lord, as your body was buried in, by the hands of sinful men, Lord. Lord, you subjected yourself in ultimate submission to the Father. And Lord, I pray that we would see the value of that. Our eyes would be open to that. And God, we would, by your Spirit, live a life that's, that's worthy of your love, God. Not because we're trying to earn it, but because we see it for what it is. And Lord, from that love, Lord, we will find joy. We will find peace, God. Lord, we'll become patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle. Lord, we'll be able to live life like men with self-control. Lord, men are, our mom and dad can be proud of. Men are, our wives are proud to say, that's my husband. Men that leave a legacy for our children. Lord, we do these things for the glory of God, Lord, because apart from you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen.